Hey fellas, Jazz here. Initially, I was hesitant to switch to Linux, and part of that was the idea that the desktop experience was going to be too far removed from Windows. See, Linux was on my bucket list for a while, notably to get a Linux version of Burbat out, since it was a pretty easy port and the extra audience would be appreciated. What I wasn't expecting was for the first time experience to be really, really appealing. This wasn't the first time I installed Linux, as I installed Pop! OS on an old computer I got from work. I got some advice for what distro I should use, and it was settled that I would dual boot my existing Windows 10 with not Linux Mint or stock Ubuntu, but Kubuntu, a spin of Ubuntu with KDE pre-installed out of the box. With the promise of better performance and privacy ahead, I set out as a Linux noob to properly daily drive Linux. And the experience was... It was great. It had its rough patches and a lot of newbie pitfalls, but otherwise I had a great time and discovered a lot about why people actually use Linux and KDE. I'll be lumping in some info about Linux and general Ubuntu stuff in here, along with the stuff that's specifically about KDE. I'll be going more in depth about what desktop environments and distributions are later on, but for now I'm going to keep things simple. As of writing, I've used two different versions of Linux with KDE, those being Kubuntu and Neon. I was using Kubuntu 20.04 on my main PC, though I recently switched over to KDE Neon 5.25. I'm also using Neon on my laptop, and it's easily the better of the two experiences, since it's using a more up-to-date version of KDE with colors and better visual optimizations. First off, the interface. I love it. It's familiar to Windows, especially with the shortcuts, but it's novel and clean enough to surpass it in many ways. Of course, the feature set is slightly different, but KDE manages to pack a lot of stuff outside of the bare essentials that make this feel way better. Night mode is cool, I like the better clipboard management, and the ability to customize pretty much everything is actually amazing. Know those people who think they're quirky putting their taskbars on the side and cringe shows? One pie trick I like to do is going up and putting four taskbars on all the screen engines. Why? Who would want this? I don't know, but you know, you can do it if you like. KDE also brings in a lot of scrap Windows features. Anyone remember in like 2010, you had a Windows 7 laptop and you just put a ton of widgets and clocks and all of those dumb sliding puzzles? Well, KDE retains that functionality. It's a big part of the KDE experience. Hey, it's the chapter tile. Wow, nice. Aside from, haha, oh, funny widgets go. You can also put some actually useful stuff here. Sticky notes, networks, a spare application launcher, readouts for internal stuff like memory network stuff and disk usage and other stuff. KDE's widgets and edit mode basically allow you to make the desktop exactly how you like it. Oh yeah, edit mode. Edit mode lets you mess around with the desktop how you see fit. Want an in-depth technical hacker man's readouts of exactly what your computer is doing? You can do that. Want to be able to access deeply nested folders from the desktop? You can do that. Did you mess up your taskbar like a complete pinhead moron? How about just deleting it and getting a new one from the right click menu? Yeah, you can do that. This is what Windows 11 should have been. The level of customization is something Windows users would dream about. A lot of these are good reasons to use KDE, although due to the larger feature set and slightly higher RAM usage, another environment like XFCE or GNOME might be good if your hardware isn't up to scratch. If anything, it's not too bad. Also, I think the people saying KDE is bloated are acting kind of entitled and are over-exaggerating for the sake of argument but that's beside the point. Anyways, I've gushed enough about KDE specifically, so now I want to talk about... So, for those not in the know, the general concept of Linux is that the term Linux itself only describes the core part of the operating system. The Linux desktop comes with a bunch of different distributions, of which there are a lot, like 5,000 of them. Each distribution comes with a desktop environment, for example, Kubuntu and Neon are different distributions, but both come with the KDE desktop environment. Yes, different versions of KDE, but at the end of the day, it's still KDE. Oh, and if you hear anyone saying it's actually GNU slash Linux, firstly, who cares? And secondly, it's basically just an extra set of tools that lay over the top of the really low-level Unix stuff. And then the desktop environment is laid over that. And that's basically how an operating system is made, more or less. The common analogy is that these are different flavors of Linux. Ubuntu is vanilla, Neon is chocolate, Mint is mint, I guess. 
Basically, they're all just different versions of the same thing. I recommend KDE Neon if you're a newbie, especially since you've basically already seen what KDE can do. Right away you will notice how much less slowdown and bloat there is compared to on Windows. Everything feels a lot more snappy and responsive. Also, learning Linux has really helped me see what open software is like, and it's also explained my issues with computing in general. I always just thought that when programs slowed down pretty hard, I kind of just accepted it. But now that I use Linux pretty regularly, it's pretty obvious that the main reason Windows is a lot slower is because of the telemetry. A while back I was writing the script on my laptop when it still ran Windows 10, but due to the fact that I don't have an Office 365 license, I decided to install LibreOffice, which was the Office suite packed into most Ubuntu-based distros. I didn't even know this was an option before I switched to Linux. I was also using applications like Inkscape and GIMP on Windows regardless, and when I realized that they were better on Linux, I was really happy. Funny story, I actually spent 150 bucks on Camtasia, which was my video editor for several years. Then when I found out about Caden Live, I realized how much of a scam that Camtasia was, especially since it's nowhere near as extensible as what I'm using now. Anyways, you can tell which video editor this video is being made on. On the topic of software, licensing. No. Why? Well, because everything is free and open source and generally doesn't use any user accounts or DRM or anything like that, software licensing for most of the popular Linux apps is a relic of the past. Yeah, just a quick correction. By licensing, I don't mean like GPL2 or the BSD license or any of the free and open source license. I'm more sort of talking about end user like license keys. Anyways, back to the video. You know what else is a relic of the past on Linux? Antivirus. No one writes viruses for Linux. No one. This is because of the smaller user base, the structure of Linux, and because people that tend to install their own operating systems tend to be less gullible. This makes Linux the worst target for any sort of malware. Hell, even Mac is better than Windows in that regard. This means that unless you are running large servers or are otherwise a high profile target, there is no reason to run any of the few antivirus options that are on Linux at all. Lastly, a lot of the first party spyware that's built into Windows as a whole just isn't there. It's not that Linux somehow takes out the tracking stuff, it's that it was never designed with it in mind in the first place. Also, the tracking stuff takes up disk space, memory, and internet bandwidth. So yeah, thanks Microsoft for making your operating system literally worse at performance on a fundamental level. Now you may be listening to this thinking Linux is all sunshine and rainbows. And in most cases, it is. It will probably make your life a lot better by way of less hassle for most basic computer stuff. However, the road to the promised land is intimidating, slightly convoluted, and full of messy edge cases, blind spots, and gotchas that can do anything from ruining your Linux install in annoying ways to losing you data. That being... Considering people have spent a large majority of their lives jumping through Microsoft's hoops, suddenly changing to a different set of hoops is going to throw someone for a loop. This is why when I recommend someone Linux for the first time, I tell people to use a virtual machine to learn how Linux works before installing it proper. VirtualBox and VMware are good options on Windows. If you're having trouble virtualizing something like KDE Neon, use Zubuntu or another lightweight distro instead. Learn how it works, try to write up a document and browse the web, and learn to install applications from the terminal or your software manager. Remember, nothing carries over when you delete the virtual machine, and it cannot affect the host computer. When you want to install Linux on your computer proper, back up your data. I don't care what drive it's on, if it's valuable enough for you to worry about it, move it to an external hard drive, cloud storage, or extra USB. I personally consider the spring cleaning aspect to be a part of the process, and it's also a chance for people to reorganize their files to their liking. The only thing to really worry about before installing is the Windows product key, so be sure to find out how to get that and write that down before installing Linux. Once all the files are off the PC you want to install Linux to, you'll need a few things. A flashing tool called Balna Etcher, a spare unused USB stick, and the .iso file for your Linux distro of choice. Flash the ISO to the USB stick using Balaner Etcher and plug it into the PC you want to put Linux on. Then turn the PC off. Turn the PC back on, 
then access the boot menu, which is different between most PCs, and then go through the install process in the live environment. Unfortunately, for most people, this really isn't an option. Not because they can't do it, but because people are too scared to. Or you have Windows software that requires specific hardware and can't be virtualized or run through something like Wine. This is the big hurdle that people have to jump before they can really use Linux. It's certainly not the terminal. That can be taught with time and patience, and unless you try to do stuff that's way out of your league, you'll mostly be fine. The install process is something that people either don't know exists, don't know how to do, or are too scared to do because they fear it might break something or void their warranty or some other fear. Don't worry, as long as you backed up your files and you know how to use Google, you'll be fine. You will have to reinstall your programs once you're on Linux, but usually these programs are more optimized and faster than on Windows. That's how you install a Linux distribution to your PC on bare metal and start using it proper. Don't be afraid to give it a shot sometime. In terms of some problems I got during my first months, I did have to reinstall a few times. The first time was failing to restart after a kernel update, and the second was a botched XFCE install and uninstall. I've had other miscellaneous problems, but those mainly came from dual booting with Windows 10 and general incompetence on my part. This was on my main PC, which was really annoying, however I never lost any files and after a quick reinstall I was always back in the game. Well that, and I learned what I did wrong pretty quick and made sure not to do that again. You can easily run recovery mode or repair tools for some of the most basic stuff, and using the live environment if you have the install USB handy can easily get you back all of your files. Well, unless you... If someone tells you to run this, ignore it. sudo means super user, rm is remove, and dash rf means force recursively. The slash is the amount point for the whole operating system. The drives in your PC and any and all USB sticks and external drives you have. Never run this. If you do, unplug everything and turn off your PC immediately. Congratulations, you have successfully avoided the oldest trick in the book. Welcome to the club. Other than that, that's pretty much the extent of the noob traps when installing and using Linux. This list is by no means comprehensive and it's also not really a full tutorial either. Just something to think about. I recommend to go and do your own research and find a bunch of installation tutorials to watch and read. I'll leave you with this. KDE is probably the best desktop environment out there, at least in my opinion. Its feature set is solid, having a lot of niche features without going completely overboard like Windows does. I mean, seriously, who uses Windows Dictation? It's a good choice for both newbies and power users. As for Lynx as a whole, yeah, it's a great operating system to use, better than Mac and Windows in a lot of notable areas, and is generally great for privacy, security, performance, customizability, and a few other things. If you choose to use Linux, make sure that you do your research, it's ultimately worth the initial effort and even if you fail, you'll probably be better for trying than not. Change takes time, and ultimately if you're willing to take a day at worst to set it up, you gain all of the benefits. The choice is yours to make, so go choose your distro and give it a go. And if you don't like it, well, at least it's better than Windows 11. Thanks to everyone who helped me with learning Linux, and a big shout out to those in my community who use Linux, thank you for the pointers. I'm sorry that I've been gone for a while, it's just been a hectic June, and next video will likely be something related to Open Fortress, maybe Burbout. Other than that, thanks for watching and take care. <laughs>